Well, y'all, anybody excited to dive into the Word this morning? Hey, man, I'm very excited. I'm honored to be able to speak to you today, uh, and I believe it's going to be a great day. As I'm getting ready to dive into the message, just two pushes that I want to give. I know that they've already been talked about. Number one, miracle night tonight. I really believe that God has been preparing our people and our church for miraculous things. And so we've changed the name of our passionate prayer to Miracle Night. Why? Because we believe that the miracle, that miracles are about to take place. We believe that the miraculous is about, the supernatural is about to begin taking place. And so I really want to encourage you, if that is something that you are interested in, if you need a miracle, if you know somebody that needs a miracle, bring them. And, uh, and let's put our faith together. Let's believe in that. That's tonight. And then secondly, y'all, make a difference day. Now, the reason that I want to put a big push here is because we really need to plan for next week. And we only had like 37 names on papers last week. So that's okay if only 37 people are coming. But we do have to plan. So if you are planning on staying for Make a Difference Day, then we really need you guys to either text us or to sign up in the back so that we can make sure that we have everything that we need as far as food, as far as shirts, as far as what team you're going to be on, all of those things. We're trying to prep and plan that. So right after service today, make sure you sign up for that. Well, y'all, last week we started a brand new series. How many of y'all remember what the series was called? Oh, you guys are awesome. Addicted to Love. And last week we tackled the question, why do we love? It's really profound. The answer, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. We love because he first loved us. That's the answer to that question. Why do we love? Why as Christian people are we obligated to love other people? We're obligated to love because he first loved us. So that's what we tackled last week. And, uh, and, and I'm going to be honest, last week I was a little bit uncomfortable because you guys were quiet. It was ridiculously quiet. It's never quiet in Clawson. Last week was, cl- was quiet and that's unacceptable. So today I need you guys to help me out a little bit. And if you don't help me out, I'm going to be preaching all day long. So it's completely up to you guys. I'm pumped. Like I said, we're talking about love and y'all. Everybody say, ah. Did y'all hear that crack in my voice? Love. Y'all, I, I have to read something. It's, it's somebody's, they, I was told not to tell you who, but it's somebody's very first anniversary. It's their one year anniversary today. And, and the husband has really wanted to do something special for his wife. So he asked me to read this. And typically I would say no. I get, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching. I'm not going to read your love note to your wife in front of, but I'm preaching about love. And so I thought it would be appropriate. I'm going to read this real quickly. It says, to my amazing wife, this has been a heck of a year. First year. I love you so much. I do not know what I could have possibly done in my life to deserve you. Whatever it was though, I would do it over and over and over again. We've been through so much that I still cannot believe that it's only been one year. You're an amazing wife and an even more amazing mother. You are slow to judge and slow to anger. You are empathetic and caring. You, are always, you always put everyone else in the family above yourself over your own wants and needs. Like I said before, you are amazing. And I cannot wait to see where we will go for the rest of our lifetime together. I was looking for him. I don't see him right now. I'm not going to call him out because he asked. Oh, I see him. They sit on this side of the church, y'all. So if you, uh, I told them I wouldn't call their names out, but if you see them and you know who they are, make sure to congratulate them. Their first year anniversary today. We're talking about love, y'all. I love the topic of love. In fact, I got an argument in an argument this week uh, of, of the topic of love, of what love is and defining love. How many of y'all have ever heard of the, the five different kinds of love languages? Okay, y'all help me out. What are the love languages? Acts of service, somebody else. Gifts, somebody else. Quality time. Physical touch, just one more. Words of affirmation. Okay, so let's play. How many of y'all have done any studies on these? Oh, y'all are bad people. Y'all needed, how many of y'all are married? Y'all should do a little research, y'all. You want your marriage to go good? Do some research. Okay, so for those of you that have done some research, how many of you receive love best through gifts. Okay, there's a few of y'all. What about words of affirmation? Okay. What about quality time? I knew that was going to be a big one. That's why I said it like that. (laughs) What about, what are the other, physical touch? And all the men, raise their hand. (laughs) (laughs) And what was the last one? Acts of service. 
acts of service. Okay, okay, okay. How many of you have no idea? Listen, if you have no idea, it's really, really cool. It's so important too. Let me just, let me stay here for just a minute. It is so important, especially if you are married and if you are a Christian and you want to show love to people, for you to understand that everyone shows love differently and everyone receives love differently. For example, I've been married for 16 years, be 17 years this year, and I have learned that just because I think that I'm showing love to Christy does not necessarily mean that she's receiving it as love. It's crazy. For myself, I'm going to sound cheesy. I actually, I receive love from my wife the best with words of affirmation. I don't know why, but like when she tells me, Josh, the grass looks so good and you, you worked out there and it was, you're dang right I did. <laughs> like, I, 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 that does something to me. That shows me that she appreciates me and she loves me. When she tells me that I preach good or, you know, what if I'm a great dad. When she gives me those words of affirmation, it, it just does something inside of me. Now she could give me, that's better than 100,000 gifts. That's better than um, as many kisses as she wants or physical touch, although physical touch is good too. Uh, that's, that, that the words of affirmation is, is what really, really reaches and speaks to me. But for Christy, it's completely different. For Christy, I can give her as many words of affirmation, as many gifts, as much physical touch as I want. And if I do that, she's gonna think I'm trying to buy her love. Seriously, we've, we've had so many arguments about this, but all I have to do to show Christy that I love her is acts of service. If I go wash the dishes, boom, I'm climbing the tree. <laughs> For those of you that were in the Songs of Solomon class, you understand that. If you were not, don't worry about it. And so by acts of service, if I give her acts of service, it is showing her how much that I love her. Now, why is this important? It's important in your marriage, but it's also so important for Christian people because Christian people have to understand that just because you think that you're showing love to someone doesn't necessarily mean that they are receiving it as love. Amen. And we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna unfold that a little bit in the coming weeks. Today, what I wanna talk about is the importance of love. I want us to dive in and dig into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want to read verse 13. And it says three things that will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Everybody say the greatest of these. Grace. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the greatest of these. Grace. Listen, the title to the message this morning is the greatest of of these. The greatest of these is love. And we're going to hang out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you want to turn there with me as you're turning, I want to give you some context of, of, of what's going on here to fully wrap our minds around what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says. I think it's, it's a, a big deal for us to understand context and the perspective of the Lord as we dig into that. So two very important things that you need to understand as we're digging into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Number one is the meaning of love in this context. Okay, we dug into this last week. Remember, point number one last week was the right kind of love. And I showed you that in the Bible, there's four different kinds of love. You have brotherly love, which is philos love. You have eros love, which is a, a passionate and sexual love. You have uh, stores love, which is family love. And then number four is agape love. And agape love is the selfless, unconditional love that we learn from God because God gave us this love when he sent Jesus to die for us. And we can't actually fully comprehend that love. We just understand it through our relationship with Christ. So the very first thing that you need to understand is when we're digging into 1 Corinthians 13, the type of love that we are talking about here in this context is agape love. I, I read this quote this week, it was so good. Agape love is given, not because the beloved deserves it, but because the lover chooses to give it. Man, y'all, that's good. You, you might want to write that one down in your notes. Agape love is given not because the beloved deserves it, but because the lover chooses to give it. This is the way that God loves us. And this is the way that God has called us to love other people. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what my emotions are like. It doesn't matter how angry I am with them. God has called me to choose to love them no matter, 
no matter what, just like he's done with me. The second thing that I think that is very important for you to understand as we dig into this is who this is written to. Now stay with me here. This book was written to the church in Corinth, which is a city in ancient Greece, very famous throughout the world for its sexual immorality. So the Corinthian people had a very skewed view of love. And Paul in this letter is trying to clarify and give them an explanation of the love of God. Now stay with me here. This is important. The Corinthian Christians loved dramatical spiritual experiences. Kind of like what we got to experience this morning. They loved very, very big spiritual experience. They loved supernatural gifts and speaking in tongues and miracles and healings. The issue was that they lacked the most basic thing that we are supposed to have as the people of God. They lacked having love and understanding the agape love of Jesus Christ. They became so obsessed with the supernatural, speaking in tongues, healings, prophecy, that those things begin to be done out of a place of pride and selfishness instead of a place of love. Anybody know any Christians like that? What about groups of Christians like that? They are very spiritual. They seem to know so much in the supernatural. They seem mature in their faith and yet they lack literally the only thing that God actually cares if we have or not, love. If you have struggled with that in your walk, I would like to tell you that you can listen to Paul and learn from Paul this morning, the most basic and the most important thing for the people of God to have is love. First Corinthians chapter 13, let's get started. Verses one through three. It says, if I could speak in all of the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, look at this, I would be nothing. If I gave everything that I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Okay, three points this morning. On love from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, number one is this. Love is our number one asset. Now listen, as we dig into these scriptures right here, the very first three scriptures, we see so many big assets in the kingdom of God. Listen to what he says. He says, if I could speak in all of the languages of the earth and all the languages of heaven, that's a huge asset, amen? If I could prophesy and give all of the prophetic word, if I had great faith and prophecy and spoken tongues, don't miss this. These things are huge. What he's saying is, if I did all of these things that are great things and huge things, but I didn't have love, then I would be nothing. Listen to me there right now, there are people that are searching for churches that their characteristics are defined in chapters one through three. Oh, I really want to go to a church where, where they just have healing going on. I really want to go to a church where there's prophetic words that are given. And as they give prophetic words, we begin to, we begin to understand the future and what's going on in the end times. I don't ever hear about end times in my church. And I don't want to hear about the end times. So I want to go to a church where they're talking about the end times. Or I want to go to a church. I mean, you put whatever it is where they speak in tongues all the time. I want to go to a church where they're just jumping around and going crazy. I want to go to a church where they're not. I mean, you put that in, whatever you think. People literally go church shopping, looking for things that are the most important to them. Can I be honest with you? I want all of those things in our church. I loved it this morning is I could feel the, the spirit of God go up my spine and just make my whole body tingle. And as, as the, the, the different words were given and interpreted, I love that. I want every single time for the altars to be full and for people to experience healing and for prophetic words to be given. I want all of that. I desire it. And I want it every single week. But I want, what I want you to know, church, is that if we have all of those things, and we don't have love, then literally everything that we have is pointless. And the Bible says that we have gained nothing. That should speak volumes to God's people. 
the biggest thing that people should feel from a follower of Jesus Christ is not healing, it's not prophecy, it's not pride, even though that's, t- that's a lot of times what they feel. The biggest and most powerful thing that people should feel from a Christian is the love of Christ. I love this quote, y'all. Love is that thing that if a church has it, it doesn't really need much else. And if it doesn't have it, whatever else it has doesn't really matter very much. God, it's so good. So good. Look, look, I'm going to speak to you for just a minute. I got a, my, uh, a few tools out here. How many of you work in construction? You work in construction. Some of you. Okay. What are the most basic tools that you need to work in construction? Okay. Yeah, I got both of them. Boom. Your first one is going to be a tape measure. And your second one is going to be a hammer. Those are the most basic of tools. If you work any type of construction, if you're not the leader, and and listen, if you show up to work, I did this one time. I worked with my dad for years and years and years. I was about 18 years old. I'd been working at Cafe Rio. He asked me to come and work. I showed up and I didn't have my tape and my hammer. You know what he said? He said, you might as well go home. (laughs) Why? Because you can't do nothing without a tape and a hammer. These, these tools are the most basic of things. I can't do anything without these tools. Can I be honest with you though? There's some other tools that are a lot funner to work with. You know what I'm talking about? Like, these are not fun to work with. They're just necessary. But this, this oscillating saw, I will cut you. I'm just kidding. I will cut wood or whatever. I love to play with this saw. Listen, sometimes I do work just so I can play with this saw. I like this saw. Me and this saw, we have a great relationship. And so this saw is very, very fun for me to play with. But this saw is not necessarily something that I have to have to work on the job. As as a matter of fact, this saw has only been out for what, like seven years, 10 years? And so it's not something that I have to have, but I don't really want to work with these. I want to work with this thing. So many times, this is just like people of God. This is what we're looking for. I I mean, love, yeah, everybody's supposed to have love. love, 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 love. I don't want to work with love. I want to heal people. I want to have great faith. I want to work with the oscillating saw because it's so much funner to work with. But what I want you to understand from one contractor to whatever we are today, if you do not have the most basic of things, if you do not have love as a believer in Jesus Christ, then you might as well get rid of the oscillating saw because whatever work you think that you did, the Bible says you did nothing. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that number one that we need to understand is love is the number one asset that we have in our toolbox. Somebody say amen. Amen. Love. (laughs) Thank you, Tate. I think that was Tate. Thank you, Tate. I needed that. Love is essential to the life of a believer and love is essential to the life or death of a church. You know, my favorite thing about this church, when new people come in and the very first thing that I like to ask, hey, what what was your favorite thing about our church? Or what was your least favorite thing? They don't, for whatever reason, they don't like to answer that one. What was your least favorite? You know what I always get? I love that everyone loves me. I love that it feels like family. I love that when I come in, then, then people just, I love that. Why? Because the Bible says that's literally the most important thing. And if we can't do that, then it doesn't matter what happens down here. Because this is not what changes people's lives. Sometimes it freaks them out. But love always changes people's lives. Moving on, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four through seven. Read this with me. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustices, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. 
Man, I wanna, I wanna share with you point two based off of these scriptures. This is this, true love is impossible to fake. Mm. Let me give you another scripture. First John chapter three, verses 18 and 19. It says, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other, but let's show, it by, show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident we stand as we stand before God. Mm. True love is impossible to fake. Why? Because our actions show people the truth. Yo, it's so good. Have you ever met someone that was just really, really good at saying all the right things? I, I know lots of those people. Really good. I mean, they can just talk you into every, all the right things and talk you in there. Like half of what comes out of their, their, their mouth is mumbo jumbo, but you don't, you don't get that because they talk so good. Right? Listen to me. In the world that we live in, I know, I know people like that. In my family, we call them fake people. And I bet if I was to break this group, this, this church family right now into a group of 20 people and I went to all, to a group of 20 groups and I went to every single group and I said, what is your biggest pet peeve? I bet at least one person in every single group would be, would say fake people. Fake people. Nobody wants to work with fake people. Nobody wants to hang out with fake people, but sometimes it's hard to see fake people. You know why? Because in our culture, we've gotten so, so good. In a culture where Snapchat filters and picture perfect social media posts are all the rage, it's so easy to fake. But the Bible says that in this scenario, you cannot fake love. Why? Because love always shows up through your actions. And you can say that you love somebody and you can say that you love Jesus and you can say that you want to follow his will and you can say that you're a Christian. You can say literally whatever you want, but your actions will say the truth. Mm. That hurts, pastor. Your actions show who is real and who is fake. So what are you saying, pastor? I'm saying stop faking it. I'm saying if you've been faking loving people, stop. Just really love them. You'll change them when you love it. If you've been faking being a Christian and you've been hiding all of these things, stop. God already knows that you're faking it. So stop faking it and get real. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, get real. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. And it's powerful. Really love them. Somebody say really love them. So what does that look like? What does really loving somebody look like? I just keep singing that song in my mind. This is real love. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> what, thank you. What does really loving them look like? Real love looks like this. It's looking out for the best of somebody else and not myself. Real love stays the same and doesn't change based off of circumstances. It doesn't matter how somebody else responds or reacts. Real love reacts the right way. Real love, the agape kind of love is not always easy to live out. It has guts. It takes putting aside how we feel and responding in love. Real love is patient and kind. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Listen, real love doesn't fail, y'all. That's so good. How do, how do we define it? How do we, how do we know if somebody's real or if they're fake? Because they show the fruits that First Corinthians is talking about. So a lot of times what we say is we say that we love people and we want to love people and we want to love God, but the fruits that we're showing is not love and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. It's not those things. What we're showing is envy and pride. And selfishness. And we really do want to love people. But instead of allowing the fruits of the Holy Spirit to, to, to bloom and be fruitful in our lives, we allow these other things to bloom and be fruitful in our lives. And so when we go out and we try to love people or we tell people that we go to church. You go to church, huh? 
They let anybody in there. <laughs> Why? Because we're living fake. And here's my word to you today. This is what Paul said. Don't just pretend to love. Don't just pretend to love God and don't just pretend to love people. Really love them. All right. Number three, true love is everlasting. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses eight through 10. It says prophecy and speaking in unknown languages, special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is in part and it's partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. Here's what I want you to know. True love is everlasting. Amen. Faith, hope, and love will last forever. And the greatest of these is love. True love is everlasting. When everything around us become useless, love should be the foundation that we build everything on. Love is what we're supposed to have to offer the world. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. I'm going to give you a scenario. Here's a scenario. You're standing before, <clears throat> in heaven, before the judgment seat of God. And he comes to you and he asks this question. Such a powerful question. Here's his question. Did you accomplish the things that were most important? Did you do what I told you to do? What's running through your mind right now? Oh, snap. What did he tell me to do? Here's what he told us to do. The greatest two commandments that he gave us. Love God and love people. And then he even said this, the entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two things. What matters most in your life is that you love God and that you love people. And I don't care about everything else that you do. Snap. Yeah. You're standing for, before God. I want you to think about your life right now. I want you to think about what you see is important and is not. I want you to think, have I been fake? Have I been real? Think about these things and imagine what God would say to you right now if you were standing before him. And if you don't like what you think that he would say, then today I want to tell you now is the time to make that change. Yes. Yes. To truly love God and to truly love people. Would you stand with me this morning? As you're standing, I, I want to ask our worship team to step out and come and join me up here. <clears throat> and as our worship teams come in, altar team, would you step out and come? Every head bowed and every eye closed, just real quickly. If you're here today and maybe you have not experienced the love of Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you're not following Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you've been faking it and you know that his love is not permeating and moving through your life, if you're here today and you need to clean things up and get them right with Jesus, altar team, would you come? If you need to get things right with Jesus, today is the day to change. Today is the day to make the commitment. In just a second, we're gonna sing one song. And as we sing this song, if you're here and you need prayer, if you're here and you need to change the way that you love, make it real and make it genuine. If you're here and you need to allow the Holy, the Holy Spirit, maybe he was dealing with you earlier and you didn't come to the front, and you need to, he's been dealing with you and you need to come up and get prayer. Or if you're here and you just wanna step out and come surrender yourself to God and worship him this morning through this song, then with every head bowed and every head closed, as we begin to sing this song, would you step out and would you come? Right now, every head bowed and every eye closed, would you step out and would you come?